securities attorney, Laura Anthony, founding partner of Legal and Compliance, a full service corporate securities and business transactions law firm. Today, I'm going to continue my discussion regarding how depositing penny stocks with brokers has become increasingly difficult, particularly in light of the charges brought by the SEC against E-Trade Securities. This is the second segment in a two-part securities lawcast. To summarize our last lawcast on the topic, the sale of securities must always either be registered or an, there must be an available exemption from registration to rely upon. It is the person relying on the exemption that has the burden and responsibility of ensuring that a valid exemption exists. When selling through a brokerage account, the brokerage firm has its own independent responsibility under Section 4A4 of the Securities Act to ensure that a valid exemption exists for the sale. The brokerage firm has a duty to make reasonable inquiry, that's key, in meeting its duty and obligations to be sure the exemption exists and Generally, the underlying exemption that the seller is relying on and that the brokerage firm has to confirm is Section 4A1, which is an exemption for sales by any person other than an issuer, underwriter, or dealer. On October 9, the same day the SEC announced charges against E-Trade Securities, the SEC also issued a risk alert summarizing deficiencies that were discovered by the SEC's Office of Compliance Inspections and Examinations during a targeted sweep of 22 broker-dealers that are frequently involved in the sale of microcap securities. Most likely, people depositing stocks for microcap were dealing with one of those 22 brokerage firms. In particular, the SEC scrutinized the broker-dealers' liquidations of large blocks of shares of microcap issuers that were also the subject of significant promotional efforts. The SEC found 80% of the firms were deficient in their compliance procedures. The SEC specifically evaluated the firm's compliance and obligations to perform a reasonable inquiry in connection with the customer's unregistered sales of securities where the firm was relying on Section 4A4 and to file suspicious activity reports in response to red flags. The SEC pointed out that many deficiencies in the firm's compliance procedures existed, including issues with firms improperly relying on the lack of a restrictive legend on the shares or shares that came into an account by DWAC or other electronic transfer. That is, the firms relied on that and they couldn't. The SEC made it clear that it is not enough that the shares appear freely tradable on their face, but that a broker-dealer has its own independent responsibility to ensure and make a determination that the shares are freely tradable. Brokerage firms cannot rely, at least not solely, on transfer agents to act as a gatekeeper, but rather they have to make their own inquiry in a system of checks and balances. Both the SEC and court rulings have found that a broker-dealer may rely on Section 4A4 if, after reasonable inquiry, they are not aware of circumstances indicating a violation of Section 5. Circumstances that may indicate a violation of Section 5 include evidence that a customer is acting as an underwriter or that a distribution of the subject shares is part of, is, is part of the transaction. Both courts in the SEC have stated that a broker-dealer may look to Rule 144 in determining or in, in understanding their duty to make a reasonable inquiry. Rule 144 provides that a reasonable inquiry includes an inquiry as to the following matters. One, the length of time that securities have been held by the person whose account they are to be sold. If practicable, that inquiry should include a physical examination of the securities themselves, the stock certificate that is. Two, the nature of the transaction in which the securities were acquired. Did they pay for them? Proof of payment is helpful. Three, the amount of securities of the same class sold during the last three months by the same seller or their affiliates. Four, 
Whether such person intends to sell additional securities by other means, such as in a private transaction or through other brokerage accounts. Five, whether such per person has made any payment to any person in connection with the sale of the securities. And six, the number of shares or other units of the class outstanding and the trading volume. That's all part of six. The SEC risk alert gave examples of the types of accounts that should raise a red flag and, and therefore further inquiry. Those accounts include, but aren't limited to, accounts of purported stock loan companies, uh, corporate insiders, accounts where a corporate insider has pledged securities as collateral and then defaulted on a loan, accounts held in the name of a corporate entity or LLC, either for the company's own or a third party custodian, uh, accounts where there's beneficial owners that are not disclosed, accounts in the name of foreign financial in institutions or offshore banks, and or accounts by other broker dealers that have sold unregistered stock on behalf of com companies, or who may have been stock promoters, and accounts using a master and sub account setup, all of these are suspicious accounts and should it raise red flags and therefore should include further inquiry. On October 9th, the SEC also issued an FAQ on the subject. The FAQ generally reiterated the risk alert and explains that brokers may rely on Section 4A4 only after making a reasonable inquiry of the facts and circumstances surrounding the transaction, including all parties involved, and as a prerequisite to the reliance on the statute. The FAQ drills down on the broker's independent obligation reiterating a long line of case law and SEC release, releases dating back to 1962. The SEC makes it clear that a broker may not rely on a third party, such as DTC, a transfer agent, a customer, or attorney for making its determination. FINRA has also issued a notice to members, mem broker dealers are members of FINRA, addressing these obligations and providing guidance. The notice lists examples of red flags that brokers should consider, including a customer opens a new account and delivers physical certificates representing a large block of thinly traded or low priced securities. A customer has a pattern of depositing physical share certificates, immediately selling the shares and then wiring the proceeds out and taking the money. A customer deposits share certificates that are recently issued or represent a large percentage of the float of the security. Share certificates reference a company or customer name that has been changed or that, or that does not match the name on the account. The lack of a restrictive legend or on depositive shares that seems inconsistent with the date the customer acquired the shares, i.e. the holding period has not been satisfied or there's other suspicions re related to the date on the certificate and the opening of the account. There is a sudden spike in investor demand or rising price in a thinly traded or low price security. It might be indicating a pump of some sort. The company was a shell company when it issued the shares. A customer with limited or no other assets under management at the firm receives an electronic transfer journal transaction of a large amount of a low price, unlisted or thinly traded security. The issuer has been through several recent name changes, business combinations or recapitalizations where the company's officers are also officers of numerous similar companies and another red flag, the issuer's SEC filings are not current, not complaint, or non-existent. Broker dealers also have an obligation to comply with the Bank Secrecy Act. The Bank Secrecy Act imposes an obligation on broker dealers to file a suspicious, uh, su suspicious activity report with the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network to report any transaction or pattern of transactions involving $5,000 or more in which it knows, suspects, or has reason to suspect that involve funds derived from illegal activities or is conducted to disguise funds derived from illegal activities, i.e. money laundering, is designed to evade any requirements of the Bank Secrecy Act, 
uh, has no business or apparent lawful purpose and the broker dealer knows of no reasonable explanation for the transaction or involves the use of the broker dealer to facilitate a criminal activity. So in all of those cases, a broker dealer would have an obligation to file a suspicious activity report. The risk alert points out red flags that, the, that would cause a broker dealer to make further inquiry and further investigation as to whether the suspicious activity report needs to be filed. Those red flags include atypical trading patterns in the issuer's securities, including trading involving sudden spikes in price and volume, certain patterns of trading activity being common to several customers, including the sale of large quantities of the shares of multiple issuers by those customers, notifications received by the broker dealer from their clearing firm that there's suspicious activities by that customer or in that customer account, the involvement of certain types of accounts, including those that provide anonymity to its beneficial owners in the liquidation of the shares of the microcap issuers, i.e. you don't know who the beneficial owners are, requests received from FINRA for information relating to certain issuers or broker dealers that there's been a FINRA inquiry, certain type of issuer information such as there's nominal assets, low operating revenue, frequent changes in the type of business activity, the name of the corporate entity, frequent changes in its directors and its management, and sales through, by, through the broker dealer by individuals known to be stock promoters. So all of these are red flags that may require investigation and the filing of a suspicious activity report. In conclusion, shareholders and investors that trade in small cap securities have seen a big shift in the procedures and process associated with depositing penny stocks into brokerage firms. The SEC risk alert explains the timing and impetus behind this shift and also provides insight into the brokerage firm's duties and procedures. To be clear, the rules didn't change. The brokers were required to make reasonable inquiry before and they still are. They were required to make an independent assessment as to the proper free tradeability of shares before and after the SEC knocked on their door. However, although most had written rules and procedures in place, the SEC found that many of these firms and their personnel were not aware of their obligations and were not abiding by these obligations and therefore that's why you see the change. Now more than ever, shareholders and investors need to maintain proper records and seek legal counsel to avoid unintended actual or perceived violations of the securities laws, which violations could result in the loss of their investment or worse, a regulatory enforcement proceeding. I'm securities attorney Laura Anthony, founding partner of Legal and Compliance. Should you have any questions about the information covered in this securities law cast, please contact me directly. Inquiries of a technical nature are always encouraged.